in Mark chapter 14. We're going to begin reading in verse 26. Let's go ahead and read the text. And you'll notice in 26, it's kind of a transitional verse after they had finished the Lord's Supper. Uh, They had had that last Passover meal, that first communion meal together in the upper room. They left the upper room and went out of Jerusalem and were heading toward the Mount of Olives. So that meant they had to leave the gates of the city of Jerusalem and go down and cross the Kidron Valley and then climb and ascend through the Garden of Gethsemane up into the Mount of Olives. And it, so let's begin reading. I said verse 26 a moment ago. Let's read verse 27. And Jesus said to them, all this is transpiring on the way. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And so interesting little point of fact about the Gospel of Mark. We learned when we started this study over a year ago that Mark got much of his information from Peter. Mark is the only one out of any of the Gospel writers that records the rooster crowing twice. This is a personal detail that Peter includes about his own denial. Jesus tells him before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. But he said emphatically, verse 31, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same thing. Now jump down with me to verse 66. We're going to read how this transpires. I know that we're skipping over some things concerning Jesus' arrest and his trial before the Sanhedrin. We're going to come back to that. I want to focus on Peter's denial here this morning. Look with me at verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying... I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. The servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. It's a tragic story, isn't it? Jesus denying, or Peter denying Jesus, rather. It it hurts my heart to read it because we see how bombastic Peter can be at times, and yet I think we all recognize a little bit of ourselves in it. Do we not? Jesus had never been tight-lipped about the cost of following him. He had been plain with his disciples from the very beginning. That following him would mean self-denial. They would have to deny themselves. They would have to bear their own cross, even die to themselves in order to follow him. That loving him would mean that all other loves, except for their love for him, would look like hate in comparison. And they had felt a little bit of this along the way. There were times that they had been in danger and that they had been in isolation and they felt the rising tension between public opinion and what the scripture said about the Christ and and what they had seen Jesus do. There were times where they were in urgent need. They had felt some of this cost along the way. But it really, if, if we're adding this up, if we take a sum total, it had never really hit home. Not yet. The bill was about to come due, if you know what I'm saying. And in the crucible of this moment where Jesus 
had prepared them. He had warned them. He had set this up three different times. He had talked about his betrayal and crucifixion and death. He tried to prepare them for this moment. And in the crucible of this moment, they would fail. Hard. And often we focus on Peter. You know, he's named in the text, and it's for obvious reasons we focus on Peter. He's, he's the one saying, they all may deny you, but I won't. But the fact of the matter is, they all said the same thing. They all claimed that their strength would never fail them. They all said what he said, and, and by the way, they all forsook him, and they all fled as well. And so it, it isn't just Peter that failed here even though he's the one we focus on. Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel record more detail about this event. We're going to reference Luke's gospel along the way. In particular, Luke's gospel focuses on the spiritual aspect of what is going on here. There's a tremendous amount of spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes, and so that brings to light really what's happening here, and it needs to be said before we go any further that this is another one of Satan's attempts to keep Christ from making it to the cross. And, and beyond that, even Satan trying to interrupt the plan of God and bringing salvation to the world, when, when he, he himself focuses upon Peter, that this is one of Satan's attempts to keep Peter from fulfilling his calling and his purpose. And we need to understand that as it relates to us concerning our own failures. And that's the accuser's goal for all of us, that he would use our failures to destroy us. That if he, if he can't trip us up in the moment of failure, compromising our integrity and character, ruining our testimony, marginalizing ourselves so that we're set aside and unable to be used by God, then he will burden us with guilt like a millstone so that we choose not to be used by God. And if we're paying attention, that's really exactly what happens to Peter. Fawn mentioned that a moment ago before we sang the song. That, and, and we need to remember this. Because all of us fail. All of us do. That Satan's desire in your failures would be to destroy your testimony, to ruin your character, and to burden you down with guilt so that you don't want to be used by God let alone can be used by God. And so if that's Satan's goal in our failures, to marginalize us and destroy us, then what is, what is God's goal in our failures? Because God, who is rich in mercy, is able to redeem our failures, right? That, that he could buy them back and use them for our good, use them for his own glory. That somehow in that he can magnify his grace, and we understand that God is even sovereign over our failures. What a marvelous thought that is. That, that God, who is in control of all things, can even be in control of our failures. What a marvelous thought. And so as John Maxwell suggests, when we fall down, we might as well pick something up while we're down there. And so in our failures, then, we learn what this text is all about. It, we're, we're to learn when we fall. You know, in our culture where pride and arrogance kind of just simmer in all of us, we don't like to admit that we fail. And when we do, when we fall down, we want to get up so quickly that oftentimes we miss the lesson that we were supposed to pick up while we're down there, and we end up repeating the cycle. We end up making the same mistakes over and over and over again because we're not learning from our failures. And so let's agree that we're going to pick something up while we're down there. Let's learn. We, we need to understand what God can do as he redeems our failures, that we can actually fail forward. And so we're going to do something this morning. We're going to look at this kind of step-by-step process. Uh, of the, the different things that kind of led to Peter's failure, the different events, if you will, in this process that contributed to his failure. And then we're going to look at the one thing that God uses to put it all back together again. 
and we're going to end on a high note. I need to make the most of my time because we have a wonderful way to end our this morning. We're going to baptize some young people who've trusted Christ as their Savior over the summer, and uh, and I want to end on a high note. So we're going to talk about how Peter failed, and then we're going to look at the one thing that God does to put it all back together again, okay? And so let's do this. We haven't prayed yet. I want to pray real quick and ask for God's help in understanding this text. And then uh, we'll get into our thoughts, all right? Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, help us as we bring our lives to your word. As we read about Peter. I confess that I have been altogether too hard on Peter. Not understanding that what happened to him happens to me quite often. I pray that you'd help us to understand this process and help us to understand that you are sovereign over our failures and that in grace you can redeem them. So when we make mistakes, help us to learn. Help us to to use these as our mistakes, these moments of trial, if you will, to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, that you would refine us by them and make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so, let's go back to the Gospel of Mark here and look at chapter 14, verse 26. And I want to I wanna key in on what Peter did first. And after Jesus shares this Passover meal with them, and what a triumphant moment that would have been, even in, in Judas leaving the twelve and going out and selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, that was a triumphant moment for them. That was an, an, an intense moment of of intimate fellowship that they enjoyed as they shared that meal together. They left the upper room. They went out of the city, out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And and on the way, as they're traveling, like Jesus did so often, he uses their their steps together as teaching moments. He, He looks at them and he makes a startling prediction. He says, all of you are going to betray me. All of you are going to fail. All of you are going to abandon me. You will all fall away, he said with certainty, with clarity. The shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. And as I mentioned a moment ago in the introduction that Luke's gospel records a little bit more about the spiritual warfare that's going on here in verses 31 and 32 of chapter 22 in Luke, there Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Peter, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And so in the midst of all of this, as as Peter bows up and bristles at that thought that he's going to fall away, that he's going to abandon Jesus, and he says, no, not me. These guys might, but not me. Jesus says, Peter, Satan has demanded to have you sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So in spite of what the Lord says, and here's the instruction for us, in spite of what God says, Jesus, the Son of God, says to Peter, Peter refuses to believe it. He overconfidently, brashly, and even arrogantly says, not me, I will not. These guys might but not me. And and so I would take that and I would suggest to you that we find ourselves on a similar path when we refuse to listen to what God says to us in the Word. When when we open His Word and we read about us, when, when we see a picture of ourselves, when God is speaking to us about the human condition, about the besetting sins of the flesh, that he warns us and instructs us in how to handle those things, and we refuse to believe it, when we think that we somehow are the exception to his word, then we're on a similar path toward denial. I hope we're in agreement about that, because that builds from here. And I'm just going to leave that with you, because I want to talk to you about the second step in Peter's denial. The first one was refusal. He refused to believe what God said to him, And then he also makes some compromises along the way. It's kind of a natural progression, if you will, 
Now let's go to Luke's gospel, and and I apologize that these verses are not going to be on the screen, so if you want to turn to Luke chapter 22, I invite you to do that. Hold your finger there, because we're going to reference some verses along the way as we talk about compromise. So as we kind of fast forward in the timeline, as, as, as they leave the upper room and go out to the, into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus makes this startling prediction along the way. And then as they're in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus invites Peter and James and John to pray with him. And then he, he departs, the Bible says, about a stone's throw, about as far as you could throw a rock, away from Peter and James and John, and prays by himself. And that's where Jesus famously prays. That, that, Lord, not my will be done, but yours be done. He's asking for God the Father to be merciful and provide a different way, uh, but God has chosen this path for the Son. And so famously then also that Jesus is under, in such turmoil and under such pressure already is so exceedingly great is the moment of this hour that he begins to sweat great drops of blood. All of this transpires, and we're kind of skipping over that and going forward. Because it is while Jesus is praying that, that he's interrupted by an angry mob led by Judas having come out to arrest him. And as we pick up the story in Luke's gospel, chapter 22 and verse 54 says that when they seized Jesus and they bound him and led him off to be tried at the high priest's house, that Peter followed at a distance. I think that's significant. And I want to talk about that for a moment because I don't think that was out of devotion for Christ. I don't think he was following at a distance because he was devoted to Jesus and he wanted to suffer the same fate, if you will, as Jesus. I think he was curious about the outcome and I think he clearly did not want to get caught up in what was about to happen. I think they, that he understood the gravity of the moment. He didn't want to be arrested. I don't, I don't think he wanted to be and suffer from the same fate that Jesus was going to suffer from. And so we find him following at a distance. And then in the very next verse, in Luke twenty two fifty five, we find that when they finally got to the high priest's house and they all assembled, that Peter... M- begins to mingle with a uh, crowd around a comfortable campfire. And I, I think this, again, is significant because he is, he is trying to subtly shift identities here as he sits down to warm himself, that, he, that he's seeking to blend in, and he takes his place among those who would have killed Jesus. That is extremely important so he goes from following at a distance like curious about what's happening to now he's mingling among those who want jesus dead so this this subtle compromise begins to take over and we have to admit that this is a long way down for the disciple who claimed that his courage would never fail don't you agree for the guy who said not me lord they might but not me He has taken his seat among those that would murder his Lord. But here's the deal, and I understand this about myself, too. When fear takes over, we begin to create space between us and Jesus that eventually leads to compromise. When we're afraid, that's exactly what we do. We distance ourselves ourselves rather from the thing that we think might hurt us and in this case peter thought that might be jesus here's how we do that we are afraid that we're going to lose our jobs and i don't know where that fear comes from but we hear it sometimes it colors our conversation and and we're you know, we got bills to pay, and, and, and we, we need money to provide for ourselves and that kind of thing. And, and so when it comes to our, to our work environment, we're afraid we're going to lose our jobs or we're, we're not going to have the money that we need. And so we make these subtle compromises. We create space 
and distance between us and our commitments, and so we maybe agree to work on Sunday. Or perhaps we blur some lines between our ethical and our moral responsibilities because we don't want to lose our job. Or when it comes to school, you know, we're afraid to be rejected, and we so desperately want to be accepted. We want to be, we want to be invited to sit at the cool kids' table at lunch, okay? And so we're afraid to take a stand. We're afraid to be who we really are because we want to be on the team and we want to be accepted. And so we make these subtle compromises along the way, creating space and distance between us and our commitments so that we can be accepted. By the way, you know, I'm, I'm old enough now that this is, there's some, some irony here to this idea of, of the cool kids. Some of you may have been in that, that clique when you were in school. I wasn't, but here's the irony. We're all old and ain't nobody cool now. You know what I mean? I look at some of those guys that, that, uh, that started on the football team and like were voted the most su- you know, likely to succeed and you know, the ha- you know, all those stupid awards they give in the yearbook at the end of the year, a- and they're all fat and bald just like I am. You know, ain't nobody cool now. But the irony is we put so much stock in stuff like that when we're young, we think it's so important, and it, if we're not careful, we'll compromise our integrity simply to be accepted, right? We do it at home, too. And this, this may be the most tragic of all, because we're afraid we're going to push our loved ones away. We're afraid we're somehow going to alienate them. And so we don't draw, we don't, t- we don't draw any lines. We, we don't take a stand at all, um, and, and we end up failing to make godly boundaries. You know, we, 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 we want to believe that as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord until family comes into town or until... There's something better to do, or until there's a conflict of interest, or until there's conflict. And so we, uh, are, you, are, you, are you picking up what I'm laying down here? This is important. We, we make these subtle compromises along the way, and as we do that, that continues to put us on a path toward denial. So Peter refuses to believe what Jesus said about him, And then he starts making these compromises, following at a distance, sitting down among those who are the enemies of his Lord, and that leads to number three, and that is disavowal. We see this in Luke 22, 56 through 60. We see it also in our text in verse 71, and then in Matthew 26 and 74. So follow along with me. Allow the Holy Spirit to have your imagination here and see Peter sitting down by that fire. Now, he's really hoping to keep tabs on what's going on with Jesus, and he's also really hoping to go unnoticed, right? That's why he's mingling. That's why he's warming his hands by the fire. He wants to go unnoticed. But ironically, he's recognized. And he's not recognized by one of the Sanhedrin or somebody who actually has power or authority. He's recognized by a servant girl. And this just tears him out of his frame. So we see in the text that in three phases, three times, he is recognized and pointed out twice by the servant girl and then by the bystanders. And each time Peter categorically denies that he knows, first of all, what they're talking about. I don't know what you mean. And then he ends up denying that he even knows Jesus in the first place. It's interesting to me that all four Gospels record this servant girl as the first one to notice Peter. It'd be like, it'd be like Ellie, my daughter, who's 10, recognizing Peter. Not threatening at all, except if you're trying to go unnoticed, right? And so what she said was pretty harmless. Hey, aren't you one of them? You know, she just simply identifies him as one of the 12, 
And you can imagine, because he wanted to go unnoticed, he wanted this discussion to end quickly, and so he's quite abrupt, hoping to just get rid of her, and responds kind of harshly to her. This happened, as I said, two more times, to the point that Peter ends up invoking a curse upon himself. That he's, he's not saying cuss words. He is condemning himself to hell. Like, like saying, God condemn me to hell. God do more so to me if I actually know what you're talking about or if I actually know this man, Jesus. I don't know him at all, he says. Wow. This, I want you to consider the three times that Peter denies Jesus because this is the same man who in, in Mark chapter 8 and verse 29 confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And Peter says, who do men say that I am? And they begin to talk about the consensus in the public forum. Some people think you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Some people think you're a prophet. And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter's the one that stands up in the midst of the 12 and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, you are blessed because Flesh and bone has not revealed this to you, but this has been given to you by my Father who is in heaven. That you understand this because of God's revelation to you. So Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and what's happening here, well, it's the exact opposite of that. And it's not just the exact opposite of it in principle. There's a word play here. That this Greek word that is used for denial is the exact opposite. It's antithetical to confession. So Peter, who had once confessed that Jesus is the Christ, now disavows Jesus, denying that he even knew him in order to preserve and protect himself. And it occurs to me that we may not be prone to do this with our words. But if we follow the progression, sometimes we do this with our actions, with our behavior. That when we're young, we disavow Jesus when we sleep around before marriage. Now, I, look, I know, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, but let's, can we be honest? That, that we live in a culture right now that that views that that views sex as a right, not something to be preserved and kept for marriage. And and that that these compromises that we've made morally and ethically with our own integrity as far as culture is concerned, ha have led to this kind of behavior where we, we engage in behavior that is antithetical to our confession of faith because that's what culture does. And, and there are so many different facets to this in our culture that, that it's not just young people engaging in fornication before marriage. It's adults looking at pornography and, and being unfaithful to their spouses, not just physically, but mentally. We do it as adults when we self-medicate. That when we look for satisfaction somewhere other than Jesus, when we do it in a bottle, whether it's alcohol or pills, when we, when we fill a plate, when we look for another relationship, when we try to self-medicate and satisfy ourselves outside of the person of Jesus Christ, man, we're... We're engaging in behavior that is antithetical to our confession. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ at the heart of that, we know that Jesus alone can satisfy every longing of our hearts. And so that is an important conclusion for all of us. That desire for stuff that is in you will never be satisfied by more stuff. It will only be satisfied by Jesus Christ. And when you are captivated by him, when he becomes the place where your treasure is, when he becomes that pearl of great price, 
and you'll know satisfaction. That, that when we long for that next relationship, if we could just meet that somebody or just maybe a child will do it or, or maybe it's another job or maybe it's some new friends or maybe it's a new house or all of these different things come into our lives and we think, we think that if we finally get them, then we're finally going to be satisfied. And then we realize, listen to me, that our relationship with Jesus Christ, if we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, then, then we can know true satisfaction and true joy. Because that relationship and that relationship alone is eternal. Every other relationship will change in death. Every single one of them, but that one, that one will open up new horizons of joy that will last forever. And so listen to me, all of those things become self-preserving, self-promoting, self-fulfilling at some point. And so what do they do but reveal to us that we're taking more steps down this path toward denial? It starts with, re with refusal, not believing the word of God and, and then compromise that leads to rejection, and now we finally arrive at number four, this fourth step in Peter's denial is pain. Sooner or later, the bill comes due, and things start to hurt. Now, understand that it, Jesus said that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crows twice. As soon as that servant girl recognizes him and Peter says, I have no idea what you mean. Why don't you get out of here, kid? The rooster crows the fifth time. That should have been like alarm bells going off. But Peter, so caught up in the moment, so caught up in his own refusal and compromise and disavowal that he can't see the forest for the trees. He can't see what is going on. As soon as the curse leaves his mouth, the rooster crows again. And what we read in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, again, in verse 61 and 62, reveals that at that moment when the rooster crows a second time, Peter turns to see the Lord looking at him. I can't imagine what that must have been like as Peter begins to sense and feel the full weight of what Jesus said would happen as it has been carried out. But when he turns and sees Jesus looking at him, that, that word looking in the original language in the Greek is a look of concern. It's not a look of judgment. You know, sometimes you get that look from a parent. My dad had this look, you know. When I was misbehaving in church or you know, he could catch my eye and give me one of these. You know, can you all see me? That, that he'd drop that eyebrow and just, pe like, stare a hole in me like laser beams. And I knew I was going to get it. He didn't even have to do anything. I knew I was in trouble. That's not, I, I kind of always imagined that this look that Jesus gave Peter was a look of disappointment or a look of anger or, man, you're going to get it, Peter. But that's not the look that Jesus was giving that, that this idea conveyed by this, I, this, this action of Jesus looking at Peter as their eyes meet, that Jesus' expression is of one of concern, of compassion, of love. And we see that begin to play out. The Bible reveals to us that, that, that as Peter is gripped by that, he expected judgment and what he saw was love. That, that he begins to feel the full weight of what Jesus said and sobs begin to swell and then these bitter tears begin to roll and he leaves. He runs out of the courtyard. We don't really know where he went. We know that he went back to his old life of fishing. He went home, you know, began to fish with his father-in-law, joined the family business again because all of his boasts about not abandoning Jesus had proved hollow, that his courage had failed, and he had been disloyal. 
But I want you to understand something. And this is where this, this pain that he feels in this moment is not the end of the story. That, that Jesus had prayed for him when Satan had demanded to have him and sift him like wheat. Jesus prayed that his faith would not fail. And yes, his courage had failed. And yes, he had stumbled and fallen. And he had made a, a grievous mistake. But his faith would not fail. That unlike Judas, this is not a spurious conversion. That, that Peter loved Jesus and had faith in Jesus and he left and went out because of his failure not because of his unbelief and so the pain of our failures is where we pick things up this is important as we bring this to a tidy end we're instructed by this we're refined by this we're reminded by this and ultimately, like Peter, we're redeemed in them. I, I don't know if you're like me, but I struggle a lot with this thing, this idea of failure. And it's not just a fear of failure now, like being afraid to try something new because I'm afraid it's not going to work out. It's this, this living in the past kind of failure, this millstone of guilt hung around my neck. I look back at the things that I did when I was a teenager, and it... It, it is so embarrassing that it, and it grieves me and I'm bothered by it still. And I think about the things that I did as a new husband when we were first married and the financial mistakes that I made as a young man and, and the things that I did as a pastor when I first entered ministry and I just hang my head and I think, how could this be? This is ridiculous. How stupid. Finally realized this week, studying through this again, that instead of instead of drowning and wallowing in that guilt for something that Christ has forgiven me from and will redeem for my good and His glory, I need I need to embrace them and learn from them and plant my flag in the ground and not make those mistakes again. Amen? Because that's what I was. It's not who I am. Right? Some of those things happened 25 years ago. That was who I was. It's not who I am. And the same could be said about Peter. And the pain of this moment, this is a learning experience for him. He's not defined by it. Because that's, that's who he was. Ultimately, it's not who he is. And that's, that's where we stumble upon this one thing that God does to put it all back together again. And it's number five in your outline if you're following along, and that is grace. And I know we use this idea of grace a lot, but I hope you understand what I'm talking about here. So Peter leaves the courtyard. He runs out. He's weeping bitter tears. He goes back to his old life, but... But here's the thing. Judas realizes what he's done when, 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 when Jesus is crucified. He realizes that he's betrayed innocent blood. And what does he do? He goes and hangs himself. He commits suicide. Peter may have returned to his old life. But when he hears that Jesus, that, that the tomb is empty, he's the first one there. That John outruns him, but he elbows John out of the way, and he's the first one to see the empty tomb. He's the first one to see the cloth folded at a place by itself. That, that he's numbered among the twelve in the upper room, that he's there in that prayer meeting, that he's with them. He's wondering how to pick up the pieces, wondering what to do. He sees the resurrected Christ appear in the midst of them, and he also is one that goes on to Galilee, as he was instructed to do. What did Jesus say? He said, you're all going to fall away tonight. The shepherd will be struck. The sheep will scatter. But when I am raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And so Peter, Peter's there waiting at Galilee. Yeah, he's fishing. But he's there in Galilee waiting, waiting for Jesus. 
And so in John chapter 21, we kind of are able to fill in the pieces. Mark doesn't include as much detail, but John does. And they've spent all night fishing, toiling. They catch nothing. Jesus is standing on the seashore there. He's got a coal, uh, a, a, coal, a fire built there. That, that there's some fish there and some bread. He's prepared them breakfast as they're rowing ashore. There's a miracle of catching a, 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 a fish there. And Peter realizes that it's Jesus. throws himself into the sea because he still still feels guilty, you know? And he, he comes ashore. And in John 21, 15, there's this, this conversation recorded for us there where, where Peter is reclaimed in grace. Now, I love this conversation, and I, I, want, I wish I had time to go into the details of it, but please, let me, let me read it for you, and we'll just touch on some things along the way. Jesus invites them to eat breakfast. And when they had finished breakfast, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That word love, there in the original language is agape. Do you love me like I love you, Peter? You know that look of love that I gave you in the courtyard when I showed you compassion, when you betrayed me, when I loved you unconditionally, Peter? Do you love me like I love you? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but he doesn't use the same word. It's phileo. It's not Agape, it's not unconditional love, it's like family love, it's brotherly love, it's Jesus, I love you as much as I can. That I failed you and I'm, I love you, I'm loving you the best I can. And he said to him, Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you love me like I love you, Peter? Do you love me unconditionally? Peter, and he said to him, tend my sheep. So Peter again says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you as much as I can. I'm, I'm loving you with all I got, but it's not much because I let you down and I failed you. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time, this time, Jesus doesn't use agape. He uses phileo. Peter, do you love me as much as you can? I know you failed me, and I know you let me down, and I know you feel guilty, but will you love me as much as you can? That's why Peter was grieved. He wasn't annoyed at the connection to three denials and three questions. He wasn't annoyed being pestered by Jesus about loving him. He was annoyed because he was grieved because Jesus uses the same word that he used. Peter was grieved a third time because he said, do you love me? And this time Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know my heart. You know I love you as much as I can. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Get back after it, Peter. Do you remember when I prayed for you, Peter, when Satan demanded to have you and sift you like wheat, and I prayed for you that your faith would not fail? Jesus charged Peter in that moment, when you are converted, when you turn back to me, when you come back to me, strengthen your brethren, feed my sheep, minister on my behalf. And so Peter is reclaimed here, and so I, I want you to hear me on this, and I want you to listen to me. Because in the midst of our own failures, this same thing goes on. If we belong to Christ, Christ will not turn loose of us just because we fail that we are not Judas, that that is not spurious. We will not leave Christ 
and, and through apostasy and go and hang ourselves. But if we belong to Christ, in our failures, he comes after us. But he leaves the ninety and nine and finds us. Amen. And reclaims us for himself. And so in the midst of our failures, whether they happened 20 years ago or they happened on the way to church this morning, let us remember that where great, a sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Where failure abounds, grace does much more abound. And so if you're like me and sometimes you wallow in failure and you just don't feel like you got it, grace abounds to you. <sighs> Amen. Right? Where failure abounds, grace does much more abound. So what happens to Peter then? They go back to the upper room, and, and as they're there on the Mount of Olives, when, when Jesus ascends back up into heaven, and they're, they're there watching, and the angels there appear again, and hey, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven, the same Jesus who, who you've seen taken up into heaven will return in like manner, and just like that, Holy Spirit comes upon them. And what happens to Peter? That he stands up in the midst of the twelve, emboldened by the presence of the Comforter, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and he begins to proclaim a Christ, and thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's a different Peter, man. Transformed by the Holy Spirit. This isn't the same Peter who denied Jesus in the courtyard, afraid of a little girl. This is the Peter who would stand up and point his finger in the face of the chief priests and the scribes and say, you condemned Jesus to die. You delivered him over to the Romans to death. This was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But through the, you know, this one event, God has brought salvation to you, and by him we can be saved. That's a different Peter, isn't it? It's all because of the grace of God. That it would be Peter who would break down the separating walls, the racial divisions, Acts chapter 10. He would be the first one to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter would do that. Scared, timid, failing, denying, compromising, Disavowing Peter would be the one to go to Cornelius and proclaim the gospel. Can we bring this to a close? We need to realize what this means to us because you may have made some horrible mistakes in your life. But if you belong to Jesus, that's not who you are and that's not the end of your story. Amen? That's not the end of it. That in grace, God will redeem your failures. He will use them for your good. And he will use them for his glory. I'm reminded of the third verse of my favorite hymn. Come thou fount. And somewhere in the third verse it says, O oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it for thy courts alone. And so, here's my challenge for you as we prepare for baptism. If you've made a mistake, if you've failed, and that guilt still bothers you, I want you to say, here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Would you let God redeem that failure today? Would you let his love reclaim that part of your life for his glory? Would you give even your uncomely parts, the embarrassing parts, the shameful parts 
over to the Lord, He will cleanse you and transform you and make you new, a new creation after righteousness and true holiness. Would you do that? Let's stand for prayer. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn what we need to learn this morning. I believe there's somebody like me in this this room who's struggling with the guilt of their past. Father, you tell us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, if we've been forgiven, we're the ones that are hanging on to that guilt. I pray that you'd help us to let that go today. That you'd help us to to cast that burden upon the Lord, knowing that he cares for us. Help us to do that today in faith. As we prepare for baptism, Lord, may we be reminded of our need for faith in Jesus Christ. That if there is somebody here today that is feeling this weight of guilt, it may be because they've never repented and trusted Christ. May that be true today. May they turn to Jesus by faith. And let's stand for prayer. Help us, Lord. Fawn sings this song of invitation. May we cast our care upon you in Jesus' name.